Hey, welcome to the video. There are a couple of other ones that if you hadn't seen them yet, go watch them. One of them is called Religious Industrial Complex and the other one is called Economy of God. They kind of are preludes to this one. The Religious Industrial Complex has gotten out of control. The wonderful idea of the Economy of God has been covered up by the business of church. Jesus taught that the body is the temple. He said that the stones of the temple that was made with hands would not remain on top of each other. God had a more organic strategy in mind. It wasn't just Jesus. It was also the prophets that were before him and the apostles that were behind him. There are ways that we can misread the scriptures. But if we're, if we're too busy looking at the scriptures that uphold the religious industrial complex, then it's going to be hard to see organic body-based covenant that Christ himself is. Why don't we look at a few scriptures that will open up our eyes to remind us that the economy of God is the covenant that God intended to pass along to us and not just a religion. We've got a few different passages here. We're going to look at Stephen in Acts 7, then we're going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3. And we're also going to look at Lydia in a bigger picture issue. And then I'm going to throw in some references for some of my other studies that I've done. So, hope you enjoy. The first one we'll get into is Stephen in Acts chapter 7. The book of Acts chapter 7, Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin. And we know that Stephen's characteristic was that he was inspired by the Spirit of God. He was a servant. He was a deacon. He was, and, and all of a sudden he gets put on the spot. Kind of like uh, when Yeshua said to the apostles, whenever you would go face people that the spirit will give you the words. And so here he is. He might not have been a speaker, but he gets the words. And so he begins to tell the story of Israel from, from Abraham. He tells the story and everything is going good. Talk about the the circumcision covenant. Talk about the patriarchs uh, selling Joseph and ending up in Egypt. Then there was captivity down in Egypt. How Joseph became the, the savior of the family. Then God was continually faithful in his promises. And everything was going good. Moses becomes the one who draws them out. Moses has his story, and Stephen continues to tell the, the details behind that, and so he, he continues on into the period of bringing them into the land. They eventually turn to the place where they were following the king. After David, he gets to the point of Solomon. Solomon, the son of David, David was the man after God's own heart. And who was Solomon? Our son was was born, and we called him Jedidiah. And, and Jedidiah is originally Solomon's name. Uh, Nathan, the prophet, names David's son Jedidiah. Jedidiah is beloved of God. But David, he wanted to build a temple. God had told him, I don't want you building a temple. You know, you've been a man of blood, so don't build that temple. But what's the promise? The Lord said that you'll have offspring, he'll be a man of peace, and he'll build the temple. The, the prophet told him, you name him Jedidiah. We won't ever hear that word but one time. And that's when it was on the prophet's lips. But David, probably because he loved God and he wanted to do good things, and, and when he had his son, instead of calling him beloved of God, he called him Shlomo. He called him peace. He wanted his son of peace to build an actual temple. So he did. Solomon built the temple. And when you look at Solomon's building of the temple, he went all out. He was building it uh, beyond specs. And it was great. It was mighty. The, the real temple is made by the real Prince of Peace. What is that temple? It is this, this body. Do you think God needs a, a big fancy temple? Uh, do you think God needs all the bulls and sacrifices? The book of Isaiah, he says, I will make you a covenant. And he's talking to Yeshua there. 
when the covenant was reformed, it's not a Bible, it's not a book, it's not a set of orders to perform. It is a person. Jesus being the manifestation of the economy of God. And so that's what Stephen was speaking about in the book of Acts. So it's at this moment that Stephen, by the Holy Spirit, tells these people something they did not want to hear. They loved the temple. They loved what Solomon did. Matter of fact, but Solomon's temple was kind of like the dream of Israel of the glory days. At verse 48, he says, The Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. Now, if this wasn't a, a shouting verse to the religious industrial complex, I don't know what is. Does God live in those sanctuaries that we make? He does not dwell in houses made with human hands. Whether, whether it's in Jerusalem, whether it's in New York City, whether it's in Dallas or Anchorage or, or Timbuktu or Kiev or London, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where, where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? The people were so stuck to their buildings. And, and Stephen was showing them that, that Solomon tried to do something that was against God's heart. Now, did God endorse it? Yes, but if you read the if you read it, um, God told him exactly what He wanted him to know. He said, "Yeah, I'll bless your temple. I, I will do what you ask." God went into this thing knowing that it was someday going to be used as an illustration that this is not what God wanted. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard anybody say that the the temple is not really what God wanted? It's like the law is our teacher to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, that doesn't mean that the law was no good. It, it doesn't mean that the law was bad. It means that the law was not meant to fully show God's will. The only way that God's will would be completed was to be in the word who is Christ. And, and that's what the, the temple was. That's what Solomon's temple was. The temple that God has in mind is not made with hands. It is not constructed. It is not made out of gold. It doesn't have rubies on the gates. It is a body, is a body of Christ. And so here Stephen turns his energies toward pointing out what God has always intended. And what God always intended was your hearts would be connected like Jeremiah 31 says. Your ears would be a Shema of God. We would always have our ears tuned to who God is and what he has to say. And he was saying, even though he mentioned circumcision earlier, that your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. And he says, you are just like your ancestors who went to the temple happily and thought it was the greatest place ever. You always resist the Holy Spirit. He said, your ancestors resisted the Holy Spirit and so do you. Because if you look back at the stories from, from the time of Moses, Moses had the glory of God shining straight directly from God, and the people just couldn't handle it. And, and they asked Moses, please, please take this away from us. We can't handle having a direct connection with God. And, and so through Yeshua, he softened the message of direct connection with God from taking it from a shaky, scary mountain and putting it into a human body. And so Jesus wasn't that scary. He wasn't that uh, intimidating to people, except in his words, except in his, the power that he had. But they still were bold enough to, to put him to the cross. But it was God who empowered him to resurrect it was God who who took him back into heaven so that he could send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the main thing here, people. It's the main idea that God had in mind to make this temple. Um, we are never instructed to build a whole bunch of little temples 
so that God can dwell in there or that even God's people could dwell in there. God's people have their own houses. This is the point that Jesus made when they asked him, can we see the place that you live? He, he had a place where he was staying. Where was Jesus staying? He was staying at the places where people needed him most. And, and so, yes, Yeshua had a place to live. He had a place to be. The method of this new covenant coming into being is this Holy Spirit. But there's good news. You've betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. He was giving them a chance to turn and, and see and experience this Holy Spirit experience that God was offering them through the new covenant. 